Oh my goodness. Would I go back in time? I think I am. Um, I think I'd be tempted to go to the future. Um, not just because I was a, a teenager when Michael J. Fox was making all the Back to the Future movies, but I think I would like to see how um, it's such uncertain times at the moment. I probably wouldn't want to go too far, but I'd love to go you know, maybe 20 years ahead just to see quite what the um, what the world looks like post-Brexit, post-pandemic, you know, with all the potential upheaval that there is in the world at the moment, just to see where where everything landed sort of 20 years hence. And did we manage to make the most of the uh, of the opportunities we've got to um, to reinvent things and to redesign, you know, how we deliver services and everything? I'd probably stick to quite a um, close horizon, but I go to the future. A couple of areas, one around data, so and um, one around clinical health coaching um, and so the data piece we're working on at the moment is really interested in looking at um, the population list of general practice or as you aggregate it up a PCA and and looking at the um, at the distribution of the high cost high need patients you know what so it looks like about one percent of patients on anybody's list consume about ten percent of the care that's available in primary care and we're looking at that sort of Pareto relationship between high cost need and high intensity users of primary care, but also looking at them over a longer time series to see are there patterns of how people become high intensity users of primary care and what's the relationship with secondary care, high utilisation, in which we've done a lot of work. So it's, we're really interested in looking at data and um, I think that's got a transformational impact because it would help focus the scarce resources on the patients that most need the 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 available resources yeah we're conscious within that of you know the unmet care needs and the inverse care law where those that receive most care aren't perhaps those that need it and the, some of the most unequal outcomes in the in a in a population are the people who are, aren't seeking health care and so I'm trying to see if we could help identify that using data so it's kind of areas a real close research around data which we think might transform not just the GP, but the wider team, who the wider team are focusing on and data driven caseloads to support that, which could help workload and outcomes. And then coaching. So obviously we've done a lot of um, health coaching. Our health coaches, we've got over 30 of them. They're, they're nurses, um, so registered health professionals. And they have been working, looking at high intensity users of secondary care and working with them in a primary care setting. But they're starting to work um, in three or four areas now, we're working directly with PCNs, so um, for data-driven and manual referrals and working within that PCN team, the R's roles funded team as it grows, and, um, and quite coaching a patient who's had a, a, you know, a very, very traumatic experience of a, you know, a non-emergency admission to hospital, say, which is what we do in secondary care, is, is, one, is, is one way into influencing a patient and talking through their motivation and and trying to um trying to work with the patient on a on a on a shared plan to improve their outcomes but working with the patient in primary care where they they haven't had that trigger but they've got the ongoing disease with which they're living is a slightly different uh, approach but also this growing team that there is in general practice where there's a pharmacist and a social prescriber community didn't work as sort architecture uh, trying to trying to work correctly with those staff so it's those two areas being data driven and also what's the right role for a coach within that um, wider team if we if if we look in the short term the, you know the, you know, the, there is all the vaccination drive the, the hot hub the the high case rates and the um and the management of the pandemic but if we were to um if we were to just look slightly beyond, uh, you know, a, a, a level of vaccination, where herd, immun herd immunity became a factor, um, and the, the, you know, the the whole disease burden that the population has beyond COVID, it's interesting when we look back at the first wave, the impact of, you know, the the not managing those long term conditions and cardiovascular conditions and events that occurred as it seemed to disappear but can't have disappeared. From the um, from the population, I think that will resurface, and many people, many more people are impacted 
by their wider health concerns and COVID in the first wave. And I'm not sure in the second wave there won't be a similar impact. So general practice is at the, the front end of that uh, need within the population. And as it rises again and surfaces, I mean, referrals are right down, you know, referrals to secondary care are right now during the pandemic. And it's hard to imagine that, that those presentations have gone. So I can imagine a, 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 a sort of backlog of demand on general practice, even beyond the pandemic, and a focus on the um, on on the, the, the long term condition management, which has been slightly forced, forced aside by the, by the pressures of the pandemic and the vaccination drives. Obviously, managing patients on the waiting list nationally, the waiting list is spiralling. Um, and you know, my previous role, you know, I did a lot of work nationally on the waiting list, and we were we were trying to get it down below four million, and um, and it's now you know six and a half million, seven million, and rising, and that represents millions of patients who are who are in their own homes under their general practitioner, and have been referred and are on pathways waiting for um, an an elective intervention, and um, I think the the burden of those patients waiting will increasingly fall back on general practice as they present with, you know, related conditions and exacerbation of their existing conditions. And meanwhile, they're still waiting. So I think that could cause a, a large challenge. But um, I think, you know, the answer to that is the, the long term, the long term plan and this this approach to try to help primary care develop a um, a more proactive care model with these uh, new roles, supplementing the workforce pressures that there are by introducing new staff where possible, um, and um, and trying to focus on the right patients at the right time. But it's, it's next six months is going to be an extraordinarily challenging period. Um, I'm really excited about um, getting back to more face-to-face -face contact with people. If, you know, if within six months we can be um sitting down you know with people in the same room and um eye contact and you know just the, if that, that social interaction i've really started it's got to the stage of nine twelve and i'm lucky because i've got a family you know family children wife you know house so i've got a busy house to live in but so i really feel for people who are more isolated than myself uh, what am i excited in the next six months about work um, I'm really, I am really excited about the the data work we're doing with primary care. I think that's going to be a really interesting, um, interesting uh, angle to get into with with GPs and their teams to look at their populations and the unmet needs within it and the rising needs and trying to look at new approaches. We use machine learning in our um, analytical teams to use AI to surface rising risk within large data sets. And um, I'm excited about that. We're doing a similar piece with um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS Scotland, and we're doing a large um, AI project with them to identify rising needs across secondary and primary care within the Greater Glasgow system. That's an exciting project that will be run out. Run out. We're, we're excited around, we've just started um, a new service called Virtual Care, which is where our clinical coaches work with patients, but they introduce remote monitoring. And we've had the first 30 patients uh, go live, um, 15 respiratory and 15 diabetic patients in southeast London. And um, where the coach works to, to build the self-management capacity of the patient, but then introduces uh, appropriate mon a glucometer for a diabetic and starts to work with them to self-monitor and also deal with the health literacy and the sort of goal setting around that with the patient proactively on a sort of a registered program. So I'm quite excited about a couple of areas where we've got interesting business developing and um, and there's a, you know, it's a lot of opportunities, so much unmet need that needs addressing that I think, um, I think we've got an interest, so several interesting product offers. I'd love to have met Florence Nightingale when she um, when she came back from the Crimea in Istanbul, and, you know, and she had such a uh, a further for presenting statistics and data, and her approach to taking such a sort of quantitative analytical approach was she must have been such a 
firebrand and the force of nature at that time, at that in that era, you know, when so little was known and so little was understood, and her her sort of such strong belief that if you if you quantify, categorize, count, and analyze, you can improve and find they uh, uh, understand more and improve. 